something God is doing something Right now He is up to something He is up to something God is doing something Right now Sorry. <laughs> oh hey, my gosh, that I'm literally sorry. scared let, me. Let us say good morning. Good vibes. Good, good morning. Good morning, everyone. How are you today? Hey, you know, today is Ray's last day. Today's Ray's day. last day. We are so excited. Yeah. As a church on where God's moving him and yeah. what, who's God's going to bring in. It's just. It's it's really cool to see the transition yes. and to be a part of what what the Lord has been doing here. Just ever since his announcement to, to yeah. this day, this is such a momentous day. It's when Pastor Ray is this last day, so right, um, right. I mean, we're we're gonna miss him. We're gonna miss him. But to to know that it's God's will on yeah. on both ends is just it's incredible. I'm super excited. What is God going to do next? Hey, and if you yeah. want to put some encouragement in the feed, yeah. maybe if the point has ever touched your life in a positive way, or if Ray has ever spoken a message that just hits you yeah. right in the heart through the Holy Spirit, just go ahead and put it in the comments. We we will 100% share it with him. Yes. And uh, his love language is words of affirmation. Yeah. So, so hashtag thanks, Ray. Yes. Oh, yeah. That's put a good that one. On yes, yeah. yes. Well, yes. it was going to be hashtag go on get, get but we didn't get. figure that would be appropriate. <laughs> so, <laughs> hashtag <laughs> thanks, Ray. Yes. So also, uh, if you are brand new with us, us, uh, and this is like a cool announcement that our pastor's yeah. leaving. You could just be praying for us. That would be awesome. But we do want to say a big welcome to you. And we're really glad that you're here. Um, I'm Deanna and this is Todd. Hello. And uh, we just kind of share some FYI before we actually get going with our uh, sermon time. And yeah. um, one of the things we invite you to do is just uh, check out the point three times. It's mm -hmm. called the three point challenge. Yeah. And um, uh, it's just, can... uh, just check us out and let, the, let, let our greeters know that you're here Yeah, uh, because they're there to greet you, make you feel comfortable. So say, yeah. hey, it's my first time. And I'll connect with you in a way just to make you feel Absolutely. comfortable. So thank you so much. We just say, check us out three times and pray and listen and see if this is where God is asking yeah. you to grow spiritually. Spiritually, right. Yeah. And then uh, in the same section, you can check that out, thepointchurch.net slash connect. Um, there is a, a section there for prayer requests, and we would love the honor of praying yes. for you as well. We are a church that believes in the power of prayer, so let us know that also on the same section. Yes. and um, Focus on the four. Focus on, oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. focus on, we do one every month, and this is World Baseball Academy, yeah. and we're asking for gently used or new gloves and baseballs yes uh, so if you want to send them on into 5335 bass road mm -hmm. fort wayne indiana 468 Oh, eight. Yes, I was, I was leaning on her for that because I don't know. I it's the one thing I can do right. Oh, eight. <laughs> Four, right. six, eight, oh, eight. And so, um, so yeah, that, and by the way, if, if you're brand new with us, um, Focus on the Fort is basically just uh, local partnerships that we do throughout our city here yeah. in Fort Wayne. And um, it's just a way for us to give back locally. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Um, what else do we have on the docket? Uh, I don't know. We got the the, the uh, story or uh, story of Jesus. Story of Jesus coming up. Yes. yes. So uh, last year we we dove into a sermon series of the story of Jesus, and let me tell you, it was 
phenomenal to walk through um, just a scripture. It was John last time, and right? It was John. I believe so. The book of John. I know that this year is the book of Mark. Yes. So, y'all, it was an incredible series last year, so stay tuned for that. It's going to start up in June. It's a great time to invite someone to church, especially for the first time, to share the feed or just invite them here locally to one of our um, on-campus yeah. services. We're going to go awesome. through that book every week, each chapter, yes, chapter. through the summer. From start to finish. So, be awesome. join on in. Join in. <laughs> All right. I ain't, I ain't singing. <laughs> Do you want to praise on? Yeah, I'll praise on. Go for hey, it. Father God, thank you so much, Lord, for just how you've been at work here and how you've yeah. been at work in and through Pastor Ray. And we thank you for, yes. for his time here. Father, we also ask for prayers that you would give visions to our next pastor, that he would see yeah. where he needs to be, that you would give our selection committee uh, understanding and wisdom and discernment on who that may be. And we just thank you for the opportunity to be a part of this and just what you're doing. We want to be where you're at because we know that's where victory is at. And we know that's where kingdom yeah. expansion yeah. is. And we thank Excuse you, Lord. We thank you for this day. I know that there's somebody out there who needs to see you and know you and maybe come back to you. Yeah. Uh, I pray that you speak to them in a mighty, mighty way, Lord, that the, they would know that it's you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Hello, Point Church. I'm Caleb Kimmel. On behalf of the board here at The Point, I want to update you on the search process for our next lead pastor. As many of you know, God has led our founding pastor, Ray, to retire this month. And just as God has led Ray to start the church, we are confident God is preparing a new lead pastor that will help us further advance our mission of helping people find and follow Jesus. First of all, church, thank you for your recent prayer support. This past week, we were able to continue our process laid out by the church bylaws and assemble a pastoral search team consisting of 11 team members. Now, those members will begin meeting next week to discuss our options on a credible search firm to help us in the discovery process of a new lead pastor. One question that I'm sure is on everyone's mind is, how long do we feel it'll take? You know, that's a great question, and we believe strongly that we don't want to rush the process, and many search firms, they advise on a six to nine month timeline. Of course, it's in God's timing, so it could be a bit shorter, it could be a bit longer. However, we remain confident and excited about the next chapter God has in store for us here at The Point. Our board here at The Point, we value transparency and communication to you, so we'll report back to you next week about where God leads us as you pray. Thank you, and God bless. It's late May, and these are the graduation days of valedictorians and salutatorians, you know, those elusive titles pursued by top students who may even later set their sights on even grander titles, such as CEO or president or partner or doctor or lead actor or director. Yet among all these honorifics that our world places beneath our names, I thought we ought to spend today focused on the most important an elusive title in Scripture. For the greatest title awarded in Scripture, one given only to the Old Testament greats, such as Moses and Samuel and David and Elijah and Elisha, is used but of only one person in all of the New Testament. You can find this title in 1 Timothy chapter 6 when the Apostle Paul ends his first letter to his young disciple Timothy, and as he wraps it up, he does something unprecedented. He refers to Timothy by a title, and not just any title, but a title that represents the very God we serve. It's a title th that we should pursue in our lives. It's that rare title, man of God. Or if you're a lady, you could call it woman of God. By calling Timothy a man of God, Paul tags him. I mean, his insta is verified. He's calling Tim one of the most godly men in Christendom. And by resurrecting this title for the first time since Jesus walked the earth, Paul is letting us know in our own corridor of history that this is the golden ring. This is the title that every believer should aspire to. See, about a week after you die, someone in your family is going to have to answer the stonecutter. The guy making the words on your tombstone is going to ask your family, what title do you want under the name? You ever thought about that? Look, when we're young, we want history to know our accomplishments. You know, he's Ray Harris, lead pastor of the Point Church, or he's Tom Brady, you know, seven-time Super Bowl champ. But in your zenith years, most of us come to realize that it is not the accolades that define us, but relationships, mother, father, husband, wife, best friend. And as special as all those relational titles are, I suggest there's an even greater title at large. I suggest that the title that we should all shoot for is one that describes our relationship with God. See, see when Paul called Timothy a man of God, he's saying Timothy is God's man, that Timothy represents God. Is that not what you would want said of you? You know, if, if it is, 
then, then how would you get it? I mean, what did Paul see in young Timothy that qualified him to be a man of God? Well, foundationally, you got to know this title is the only one in all of Scripture that refers not to a position a person holds, but to the character of the person who holds it. It's a character title. So if you want to shoot for it, then you got to know what character traits mark the one who has earned it. And when you look at how Paul used this phrase, there are four very distinctive marks that define the man or the woman of God. The first of which is in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 11. He says, but you, man of God, flee from all this. Here we discover that a man of God is marked by what he flees from. Flee is from the Greek word fuego. It's where we get our English word fugitive. It's a command in the, in the present tense, which means we're to always be on the run, to flee and to keep on fleeing. You know, when I was 10, my family lived in an addition where all the backyards opened up to a big grass field. And that grass field was a perfect setting for lots of neighborhood football games with my buddies. But my favorite games were always when my 17-year-old neighbor, Chris, who played for the high school football team, would play with us. Man, when Chris joined us, us kids felt like we were playing in the NFL. I mean, every play was an effort to impress Chris. And I think Chris liked that. I mean, he was a giant amongst us boys. That is, until his friend showed up. See, when Chris's buddy showed up, Chris kind of went from hero to zero. He went from the all-time quarterback to the, the guy who plays with little kids. And his friend had no love for us little kids. I mean, every time that guy showed up, he'd come up behind one of us and serve up a wedgie. And for those of you who have lived a life of privilege, a wedgie is when someone grabs the band around your underwear and, and from your backside pulls it up towards your ears. It's not pleasant. And it happened every time this guy showed up. Chris's buddy would grab one side and Chris would grab the other. And soon one of us kids was suspended in midair by our fruit of the looms. I mean, you'd think that we'd all run, but, you know, we wanted their attention so badly that we deluded ourselves into thinking it never happened to us. But sooner than later, one of my 10-year-old friends would be waddling home with his underwear over his ears. And after several times of this, my friends, they just ran when, when Chris pulled up. Me, however, I figured I had wedgie protection because Chris was my next door neighbor. Well, I figured wrong. One day as we're playing, Chris's buddy shows up and all my friends just took off. I, however, stood with the courage of a protected species, right? I felt untouchable, but I wasn't. The moment Chris's buddy arrived, I saw him nod to Chris. And then I saw Chris reach towards my drawers and I ran. And with two high school guys chasing after me, I ran as if my life, and at least my whitey tidies, depended on it, right? And I knew exactly where I had to run to to my carport, where my dad was working on his car. And as soon as these two high school students turned the corner into our carport, they took one look at my dad, who was six foot three tall, and who had the biceps of a Golden Gloves boxing champion of the U.S. military, and they looked at him and kept on running. Friends, this is the picture that Paul paints of a man of God. This man, this woman, is fleeing. What is he fleeing from? He's fleeing from temptation, from sin. All through the New Testament, Christians are told to flee from immorality, from idolatry, from false teaching, from lust. And here in Paul's words, he's saying we're also to flee from greed, from the love of money. Now, now please don't get the picture that the man of God's a wimp. No, the man of God just knows where to run. See, Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, No temptation has seized you except what is common to man. And God is faithful. He's not going to let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he'll also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. I mean, this really means three things. First, our temptations, they're not unique. I mean, we all struggle with the same stuff. Second, God's never going to allow us to be cornered by a temptation. And th so third, when we're tempted, God will always provide a way out. Paul says it kind of like this. He says a way out so that you can stand up under it. That day, I ran. I fled. Where did I run? Straight beneath the arms of my father. And friends, when the man of God is tempted, that's exactly what he does. He heads straight for the protection of his heavenly father. But you know, not everybody runs away from temptation. You know, a while back, our staff here at The Point, they put a mannequin dressed with a hoodie on in the back seat of my car. Have you ever gotten in your car in a dark parking lot? turned around to back out and you catch a sight of a hooded villain in your rear seat? 
I mean, it's kind of par for the course in my life. <laughs> but soon, that mannequin, I'm telling you, started showing up everywhere. Showed up at my office, in my chair, everywhere. So I decided I would kidnap the mannequin. You ever kidnap a mannequin? It's not hard. They're easy to catch. They're easy to hide. I hid mine in my son Trevor's bedroom closet. And I waited. You know, Trevor likes staying up late, so it was pitch dark once he got to his bedroom. <laughs> but have you ever opened up your bedroom closet and found a hooded guy inside? Trevor has. <laughs> People in New Zealand could hear his scream. And while Trevor requested I conduct an immediate mannequin exorcism service, <laughs> I said, Trev, I wonder how long you could live with a hooded mannequin in your closet before you get used to it. And he took me up on the challenge. For several weeks, every morning, Trevor would open his closet and he'd get a jump start to his day. You know, it's not real easy to acclimate to mannequins in one's closet. Just when he thought he was fine for it, you know, he'd go off to a camp or to a friend's and, and he'd forget and the mannequin screams would start all over again. One night he said, Dad, it's been three months. I know it's in there now. Now I open my closet and I greet the guy. Hey, what's up, hooded mannequin guy? <laughs> three months and it's normal now to see this guy every time I open my closet door. You know what, Dad? I think I'm just going to keep him in there. Listen, it was an interesting experiment. How long can a person go before a person can get used to something that would freak out most people? Apparently, it's about three months for hooded mannequins. I wondered, as I thought about Trevor's experiment, how long does it take for you and I to get used to opening the door to temptation? You know what I mean. The first time you and I do something wrong, the nervousness about getting caught, it's at a shrieking high. But after a while, as that wrongdoing is repeated and repeated and repeated, we get used to it. What once freaked us out is quickly normalized, which begs the question, what's in your closet? The man of God, he clears that stuff out. The woman of God clears that out and flees from it. But a man of God is not just marked by what he flees from, but also, here's number two, a man of God is marked by what he follows after. See, a man of God is known not only by what he runs from, but also what he runs to. Behind him are the temptations that could destroy him. Ahead lie the virtues that he desires. He's fleeing wrong. He's pursuing right. It's verse 11. But you, man of God, flee from all this and pursue. Pursue is dioko in the original Greek. And like flee, it's another present imperative that means you don't just pursue something once. You keep on pursuing. You keep on pursuing. So what is it we are to pursue? Well, in the second half of verse 11, Paul lists six virtues that the man of God must pursue. The first two are general principles. They're, they're overarching. The last four, very specific. First, in a general sense, Paul says the man of God pursues righteousness. Now, when you see this word in Scripture... It's either imputed righteousness that we get from Jesus, or it's the practical righteousness that describes the way that we conduct ourselves. Imputed righteousness is a gift from Christ. Jesus, he cleanses us of our sin, then he downloads his righteousness into us. And this allows God, when he looks at us, to see not the filth of our sin, but rather the beauty of Jesus's goodness in us. But this imputed righteousness is not what Paul is describing here. The righteousness that marks the man of God is the kind that describes a life that cooperates with the Holy Spirit to live life in a right way. You know, David asked God in Psalm 15, 1, Lord, who is going to dwell in your sanctuary? Who is going to live on your holy hill? And in the next verse, he gives the answer. It's he whose walk is blameless and who does what? What is righteous? Jesus in his Sermon on the Mount says, true believers are this. This is Matthew 5, 6. It's those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Now, now, the second general principle is godliness. You know, godliness is kind of related to righteousness. You see, righteousness describes our outward conduct. Godliness describes our inward attitude. You know, right behavior, it can be faked. I mean, you can trick people into thinking you're righteous. But the man of God has no dichotomy between who he seems to be and who he really is. Because he knows God cares not just about our outside behavior, but our interior motives our godliness. The man of God has both, both righteousness and godliness in his hand. And yet at the same time that he possesses them, he realizes, man, these traits are slippery. 
So he never stops pursuing them. You know, it's a picture Paul paints in Philippians 3.12. Not that I have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of that. One thing I do, I'm forgetting what's behind. I'm straining on towards what's ahead. And I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which Christ has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. See, as the man of God flees from temptation, he's pursuing the prize. He's got a trophy in mind. And engraved on that trophy are those two words, righteousness and godliness, along with four others. Let me name them. Two of them are internal virtues. The first is faith. The man of God has an unwavering confidence in God. He can say with Paul, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want. I can do everything through him who gives me strength. You know, the man of God doesn't need to manipulate people. He doesn't need to try to force things to happen. He lives free of such frustrations and simply depends on God to work his life out. The second inner virtue is love, a love that is unrestricted, unrestrained, and unconditional. The man of God, he loves everyone, his family, his friends, even enemies know that his love is not conditional, but given freely to them no matter who they are, what they've done, or who they've done it with. The man of God is also characterized by two external virtues, which are self-explanatory, perseverance and gentleness. Those total six virtues, righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness are inscriptions on that trophy that describe the man of God. That's what he's pursuing. That's the prize. But the man of God is also marked by a third trait. He's fleeing and he's following, but he's also, look at verse 12, he's fighting the good fight of faith. Yes, the man of God, write this down, is known by what he fights for. He's a fighter, and I like this trait. You know, men are not really drawn to pacifism. We don't like letting life just happen to us and to our families and to our communities. We want to take action. And ladies, this is why, you know, when you share a problem with your husband, his first reaction is to fix it, right? That may not be what you want, but he's wired to fight for you, to fix whatever's coming against you. And the man of God, he's a polemicist. He's a contender. He's a battler. He's a soldier. He battles the world, the flesh, the devil. He battles sin, heresy, apathy, lethargy. Paul puts it like this to Timothy in 2 Timothy 2, 3. He says, endure hardship with us like a good soldier of Christ. And Paul soldiered. He'd fought for his faith. And at the end of his life, you'll remember, he said, I fought the good fight. By the way, that word fight comes from the Greek word agon. We get our English word agony from it, where we see soldiers and athletes in the agony of their battles. And the picture that Paul snaps for us is one of a fighter that's fleeing from temptation, but not running scared because he's pursuing righteousness, godliness, faith, love, perseverance, and gentleness. And while he's in pursuit, while he's running, he's fighting for truth and he's fighting for righteousness. It's a fight that really never ends. Like the verbs in the previous verse, it's a present imperative. It's not a one and done. It's not a one-time fight. It's an ongoing fight. You know, when I was a kid, my buddies and all, we'd all run to the playground to watch a good fight. But this is not that kind of fight. Fighting the good fight is not about the matchup. It's about the purpose. Let me ask you, are you involved in a fight worth fighting for? The man or woman of God doesn't just hear of problems and lay them passively aside. He or she steps up, puts up, enters the society's ring, and punches out anything that would threaten the faith, especially the faith of their children. The man of God fights against racism, against judgmentalism, against poverty, against inequality, against hypocrisy, and more. Finally, the man of God is marked by what he flees from, by what he follows after, by what he fights for. And finally, number four, write this down. The man of God is marked by what he's faithful to. Paul says in verse 13, in the sight of God who gives life to everything and of Christ Jesus, I charge you to keep this command without spot or blame until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's talking about staying faithful. Church, I challenge you in this time where you're seeking a new lead pastor to stay faithful. It's what a man of God, it's what a woman of God does. But you know, not everybody stays faithful. Several years ago, my son's doctor put FTT on his medical chart. FTT. Do you know what that means? We we had adopted Ethan from an obscure orphanage in the outskirts of Siberia. And at his age, he should have weighed about 60 pounds, but he weighed 40. And that was fine when we got him, but after 60 days of eating in our home, (laughs) he was losing weight, not gaining. So so we took him to the doctor, and and the doctor checked our son out, and he wrote FTT on the chart. Now, Lisa, at this point, is really concerned because she's a nurse. She's taught nursing. She knows exactly what FTT means. It means failure to thrive. Ethan was in trouble. 
he wasn't growing and we didn't know why. Another 30 days went by and Ethan lost another four pounds and we were all real concerned. But one night as we're eating dinner together, my oldest son, Scott, who stands six foot five tall and who has never had an FTT anywhere near his medical chart, looks at Ethan across the table and says, dad, mom, I know what the problem is. Ethan doesn't know how to chew. And Lisa and I, we look over at Ethan, like he's got no idea what's going on. He spoke only Russian at the time, but, but we see exactly what Scott means. Ethan had been chipmunking his chicken, you know, putting it in his mouth and filling up his cheeks. And then he would leave dinner, go to the bathroom and purge. Then it dawned on us. We'd spent six weeks at Ethan's orphanage. They served him oatmeal for breakfast, soup for lunch, stew for dinner every day for the first eight years of his life. He had never had anything in his mouth that required chewing. So we enrolled Ethan in the world-renowned Harris Culinary Institute for Chew Challenge Kids, and we taught our son how to use those molars. And in just weeks, he was thriving. In less than a year, he could do more push-ups and sit-ups than anyone in our family. Listen, none of us wants to be FTT. None of us wants to wake up worse off than we were the day before. We all want to thrive. So here's the prescription that Paul gives Timothy. Be a man of God, be a woman of God, and be faithful. But faithful to what? Paul tells Timothy, his young disciple, verse 14, be faithful to God's word. Be here in church eh, to hear it preached. Be here to read it and discover who God is and what he wants from you, and then read it on your own throughout the week. For if you fail in this, you will fail to thrive. Paul says the word of God is near you. It's in your mouth. Chew on it. I mean, it's what the man of God eats for breakfast. You know, I grew up in Northern California. In my early 20s, a bunch of guys I hung out with decided we'd take up surfing. So we took off to Cowles Beach in Santa Cruz, where we all became self-appointed surf ninjas. And after a few major wipeouts, we all had it figured out. You know, swim out, duck under the incoming waves, wait your turn, and ride back on the shore breaks. And yeah, yeah, we felt like we were pros, right? So late that afternoon, we're peeling off our wetsuits and we overhear some leather skin legends changing next to us uh, saying to their buddies, I told you cows would be a zoo. Look at all these kooks. Next time, mavericks. Surf speak, you know, translation. They were telling us that our beach was lame. We talked about that five second slam from those legends all the way home. And we concluded, cows was for kooks. It was a zoo. And we instantly put it together. We're not kooks. Kooks were beginners. We'd been three times. We're not kooks. So next time we said, we're going to Mavericks. Not that we had any idea what Mavericks was. We just knew it's where those legends served. And well, hey, we were legends in our own mind, right? And now I will tell you that a 2022 kid would never make the mistake we made. They would just YouTube Mavericks. But in 1986, no YouTube. We had tube socks, but that's about it. So off to Half Moon Bay, out to Mavericks, where we discovered that Mavericks is the beach of legendary waves like 100 Foot Wednesday. Friends, we didn't ride 100 Foot Wednesdays. We rode Two Foot Tuesdays. Right? At Cows, you could take your board, paddle out 100 yards to the break, and ride ankle snappers all the way back to sand. And when we rolled up to Mavericks, the break was like a mile out. Jet skis were pulling surfers out to the break. The legends were out. The locals were out, dropping in on 35-foot waves. We just stood there. We even put our wetsuits on. It was obvious. We were out of our league. We'd be little speed bumps for the dudes riding those waves. Some of you, you, you might identify with this. To what it feels like uh, to learn that something or someone is kind of out of your league. You know, guys, remember back in high school, the girl everybody wanted to date was walking towards you and you were thinking, I should ask her out. But then your buddy elbows you back to reality. Dude, she's so out of your league. If you play softball, you ever rip one down third base and think, man, you're pretty good. Only later you go to a Cubs game and you notice the pitch doesn't have an arch to it, right? You take one look at those 95 mile an hour fastballs at the Cubs game and you conclude that's going to get me killed, right? It's out of my league. Maybe you're a weekend golfer, yike, and on a good day, you hit a couple of drives on the fairway and you actually keep the ball in bounds and you start feeling pretty good about yourself. And then you watch a PGA tourney on TV and you see pros smack a ball 300 yards straight as an arrow, and you go, wow, 
These guys are way out of my league. What do you feel like when you conclude that you're out of your league? Don't you feel like a little stupid, a little small, like you should just quit? Toss your baseball glove away in the attic, forget it, you know, put the golf clubs up. You kind of just want to give up. And sometimes the people who are pros at something like making you feel that way. A golfer, you, you'll see this on TV. He'll hit a drive 350 yards further than any of us could ever dream of hitting it. And he walks back to his caddy, puts his club away, and he says just loud enough to be picked up on the mics. Man, I didn't get all that. You know, it's a slice of life. The average among us cowering in the tall shadows of the elite who take a perverse delight in making the average feel small. You know, that happened in the first century AD. A small group of men, not men and women, just all men, were widely revered as religious elite. The legends, unchallenged superstars of spirituality. And these legends, they put the bar of spiritual expectations so high that the average guy out on the street would say, those guys, they're out of my league. I can never compete in religion against those guys. I'd have to quit my job to obey all the rules that they put into effect to connect with God. There are so many hoops. The bar is so high. I'm not even trying. I just quit. Church, I'm telling you, that's a mistake. Timothy was not some superstar. This man of God, in this passage that we've looked at today, his parents, they were from different religions. His dad was a Greek, his mom a Jew. He wasn't at his peak in life. He was just in his early 20s. He wasn't strong. He actually had a chronic stomach illness. He had no advantage over you. But he just decided to not be FTT. He decided to try. And a believer who tries who works with the Holy Spirit and not against the Holy Spirit, will thrive. And soon, someday, someone will say of you, you are an incredible woman of God. You're an incredible man of God. You want to see some true life examples? You want to know what a man of God looks like in our year here, 2022? It looks like Josh Anders. It looks like Noah Gibson. The man of God looks like Todd Mullins and Rick Cantor and Caleb Kimmel. He looks like Mike Slaypack and Dylan Hodges and Chris Parker and Van Slucher. The woman of God looks like Deanna Anders and Caroline Gibson and Linda Slucher and Miranda Harris and Kathy Carpenter and the incredible staff of God that serve you here is but a mere taste of the men and women of God who volunteer and serve you at the doors and in the community and, and in times of need and on stage. You are in great hands, church, for you are a church stocked full of the people of God, led by men and women of God. You can be one of them. There is no greater privilege, no greater title, no greater reward. And may God help you, each of you, as you achieve it, as you flee, as you follow, as you fight, and as you remain faithful, it's not out of your league. It's as close as the Bible is to your grip. Go for it. Let's pray. God, we thank you for a time of looking at this elusive title. Many of us, as we heard the beginning of this message, just counted ourselves out, said, no, I'm going to ride the bench. I'm nowhere near a man or a woman of God. But I would ask God that you would encourage every heart to know that when your Holy Spirit comes into our life, everything is possible. All we've got to do is cooperate with you, and you will turn us into something far beyond our imagination, for you have a purpose for our lives. You have a mission for why you placed us on this planet at this era of history. And so God revealed that to us as we cooperate with you. And today, friends, if you have never, ever begun a relationship with Christ, look, you're on your own. It's, it's going to be an elusive title. So start one today. All you need to say to God is, God, forgive me. I've been living without you. Forgive me. God, I want to follow you. I want to cooperate with you in my life. Would you pray that right now? Just say, God, forgive me. I want to follow you. Simple prayer. God, forgive me. I want to follow you. Friends, I pray that you've prayed that. I, I ask God to bless you as, as you enter into this relationship with him. And I pray God's best on you, church, as you move into your next era of being men and women of God. For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. Hey, church, it's been fantastic being with you these 18 years. May God's blessing continue on you as you move into the journey of becoming who he wants you to be. Keep on helping people find and follow Jesus. Here's Deanna with some details. 
Amen. Thank you so much, Pastor Ray. Thank you so much for all of your time, all of your energy, all of your prayers, and all of your uh, focus in on the Point Church and this ministry. It has been such an honor to do ministry with you, to do life with you. And um, I just am so excited for your next steps in your new season in retirement. Oh my goodness. Big love to you and Miss Lisa. Uh, Y'all put some love in the feed for our pastor. Can we just praise God? right now for our pastor and how wonderful it has been for the Lord to bless us with him and his wife during this season. It's just been so, so awesome. Now, uh, if you guys are brand new with us, we love that you've been here through the whole sermon. If you want to watch it again, or if you want to share with somebody, you can always catch our content through Facebook and YouTube. Just super easy to share from there. You can do a rewatch. You can do comments. We love all the engagement anytime. So be sure you check that out. Also, if you're brand new with us, just sit tight for just a second. I'm going to talk about giving, but I want you to know, new person, that this kind of moment is really for the folks who have decided to partner with the Point Church through giving. You know, we wouldn't ask you to dinner and expect you to foot the bill, okay? So just hang tight for a second. Now, for those of you who who have decided to partner with The Point, thank you so much for your continued faithfulness, for your continued generosity uh, each and every week. God works through you, and He really does use those resources to help people find and follow Jesus. And so I just want to say a big thank you to that. And if you do want to hop into partnering uh, with The Point Church through giving, you can do it a few ways. You can do it online at thepointchurch.net slash give. Uh, online is really a very safe, secure way. It's very easy as well. And we do have a text to give option at the number below. It's also a super easy way. You can just always text your gift in whenever you're ready to give. And of course, in-house, we do um, just drop the gift after each of the services, 9, 10, 15, and 11.30 here on our Bass Road campus. It's also a great way to hop on board with partnering with the Point Church. Now, just be sure, and um, if you guys are coming tonight from five to seven to Ray's retirement goodbye party, um, I'll put the QR code up for you. Be sure to scan that code. Let us know that you're coming. We would love to see you. The event is a free event. Say free. Yep, okay, say free. It's a free event. Uh, The one thing I would just ask, if you could, if you're planning on coming, would you just write a word of encouragement for Pastor Ray and Lisa and just uh, maybe just well wishes or even share with them how the Point Church has impacted you and blessed you for your time here. That would be fantastic because it's just kind of a sweet way to send him off with words of affirmation. Can I get an amen? Amen. So I hope to see you guys there. It's going to be awesome. And of course, be sure to check out all of the content, like, subscribe, do all the things on YouTube, Facebook. This way you always know when we put some new stuff out. It's just a great way to stay connected and we love it so much. I'll see you guys next time. Bye.